Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Decolonizing Our Thinking, Feelings and Actions. My name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, or AILA. And this webinar is part of a series this month. We're hosting our Earth Laws Month uh, a month-long series of webinars, discussions and workshops celebrating our relationship with the living world and with each other. Um, today we have two fantastic speakers, uh, Dr Mary Graham, who's at the University of Queensland um, and is also a director of Future Dreaming, um, and we've got Professor Yin Paradis from Deakin University. In a moment I'm going to just do some introductory remarks and acknowledge country. Um, and then I'll introduce uh, the three talks that we're giving today. Uh, just a reminder, because we're a large group on Zoom, if you could put any questions in the chat, then I will collate them all for our discussion at the end of the workshop. Thank you very much. So again, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Uh, we are recording this webinar uh, and it will be publicly available on the AILA website by the uh, early days of next week. I'd personally like to acknowledge country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the absolutely beautiful lands of uh, the Gubby Cubby and Jinnaburra traditional custodians. Um, this is actually a view of the what Westerners call the Glasshouse Mountains. It is a truly beautiful part of Southeast Queensland. I would really like to encourage you all to do what we often do in Zoom, which is acknowledge whose country we're on, uh, where you are today. It's really lovely for us to be able to have a little peek at the chat and know where you're all coming from. We appreciate the limitations of an online discussion, uh, but it's still really lovely that we're all here together. So, you know, I invite everyone to acknowledge whose land you're on today. Acknowledge that uh, lands were never ceded across this continent. Um, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, as for me, I'm a descendant of the um, some of the Irish convicts and a couple of other English settlers who came to this continent as part of the British Empire. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in my talk, which is about um, colonisation itself, what it's all about, uh, before we then start pulling it apart. So in our discussion today, um, the three of us are going to be talk, uh, talking about slightly different things that all fit together really, really well. I'm going to provide a short introduction to Australia's colonial history to remind us and to locate us um, into the global uh, colonisation project that took place since the early 1600s. And I'll give um, a little bit of a summary of what some of the ongoing colonial governance issues are in Australia today. And then Mary Graham will provide um, an introduction to Indigenous philosophy and the relationist ethos, which offers a really interesting contrast in different cultures and worldviews, uh, particularly as it relates to caring for country uh, and uh, the relationist ethos generally is a very inspiring topic. And then uh, our third speaker today, Yin, um, will be really challenging us. I always love listening to Mary and Yin. I learn so much. Um, and when Yin comes in sort of as the last speaker to really reflect on what we've talked about, but challenging modernity and really explaining a little bit about what decolonizing is all about. And sometimes it's more than you think it is. So that's our outline for the workshop. And if all goes well, we'll have 20 or 30 minutes at the end for a yarn, or it might actually be 10 or 20. My maths is not good. Forgive me, I'm a recovering lawyer, not a mathematician. But first, a little bit of um, promo for the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. If you don't know who we are, um, Ayla, as we call her, um, we're a small not-for-profit where we work across Australia and we're interconnected with lots of amazing networks and people around the world. Our objective, our mission is to increase the understanding and practical implementation of Earth-centred governance. Um, we focus on systems change, so changing the whole kit and caboodle, but to do that we also do work within particular silos to critique and rethink and redesign. Um, AILA is informed initially by uh, Earth jurisprudence, which is a, a Western deep ecology way of thinking about the underpinning structures of industrial society. So we like to look at uh, what uh, deep ecologist Thomas Berry talked about as those core underpinning structures of Western society, law, economics, education, and in his case, religion. So we often dabble with law, economics, uh, the way we know and do, ethics and philosophy, and participation and democracy. We like people to be rethinking how we can look at these issues to design a more earth-friendly, livable future for all of us. 
So that image just shows you we're interested in shifting from human-centered governance to an earth-centered governance system inside Western society. Um, we do particularly talk about um, Western society because um, we know that indigenous peoples have their own cultures and ways of doing. And as Westerners who created AILA, that's what our interest is. Just noticing there's people stuck in the waiting room because one of the buttons isn't working. I'll work on that in a moment. Um, I just wanna remind you all that this month we've got um, a whole range of webinars, discussions and events. Um, you, I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, we've nicknamed it Earth Laws Month so that we can be focusing in on um, how we celebrate our love of and living with uh, the rest of the nat natural world and also um, how we can, good grief, how we can actually deepen our understanding of the way we do things already, the way we can change things and so that we can shift towards this Earth-centred governance. Okay, um, and I also wanted to give uh, a little shout out to Future Dreaming Australia, which is an Indigenous and non-Indigenous partnership um, entity that Mary Graham, myself, and our lovely colleagues, Ross Williams and James Lee have created. We're involved in um, sharing knowledge and bringing lots of great speakers together, doing mentoring and learning work with other people. If you're interested in Future Dreaming, do check us out. Okay, so that is by way of introduction to what we're all up to. And in a minute, I'm going to start um, my talk, but just please bear with me. I'm doing this solo today. Um, I need to let people in. And the enable room is not working. Why is that not working? I've been letting people in. Oh, sure. thank you, Yin. Can you keep doing that? I Normally I have a backup, but not here at the moment. So thank you, love. All right. Sorry about that. So I'm going to try um, in about 15 minutes to just re remind us or for some folks who've never even thought about the history of Australia, just putting us into the context. If we're going to think about decolonizing, it's very helpful to first think about what colonial or colonizing uh, structures are like. So if I'm going to talk about colonization, why am I starting with governance? As you may have picked up, uh, the way we talk in AILA, the way we look, the lens we use for critiquing the systems we have so that we can build more just and more environmentally sustainable ways of being, uh, we often look at this governance word. I often joke that it's because governance is sexy, but people don't believe me. Why do we talk about governance? Well, to us, and I know when Mary and I first met, we were both, I think we were excited to discover other governance nerds um, because governance is a wonderful catch-all for something that I refer to as simply the rules we make as human beings to live, work and play together at every scale of human activity. And it's a really interesting way to cross cut all kinds of issues to actually see how human beings are working together because at the end of the day, we love the living world, but we can't control the living world. We have to look at our own behaviours and our own actions. So the rules we make to live, work and play together are often manifested in our societies as norms, morality, written law, verbal law, ancient stories. Throughout time, in every culture, in every group, most human beings have found ways to organise and work and live together. And it's these uh, cross-cutting issues of governance that um, particularly Mary and I uh, have been looking at and working on a book together about these some of these issues from different cultural perspectives. And I guess the reason I talk about governance is because it helps us critique some of the things that Western and industrialised societies are doing in a destructive way to the living world. It helps us unpick them, understand them, and if all goes well, restitch them and do things differently. So underneath all of the things that we do, whether it's in the office, at home, at the tuck shop, as CEOs in big flash organisations, the culture, the values and the beliefs that lie beneath our groups, our societies, di directly inform our actions. Not rocket science, we know that, but that's my explanation for why I particularly frame things in a governance sort of framing. So... If we're thinking about governance as the cross-cutting lens, let's just remind ourselves what is colonization? And particularly here in Australia, as what I refer to as a colonial country or a colonial legacy legal system, why do we need to understand colonization? First, I wanna do a quick thinking exercise. Let's all think about and imagine 
what the world looked like in the year 1400. Even if you're not a historian, you might know that that is about 100 years before European colonisation really got started. Just have a think, what did the United States of today look like in 1400? What did China, South America? This wouldn't be a question you ponder on your average day being busy human beings. But let's just for a moment think about what the world looked like before European colonisation. For example, until I started looking, I did not know that this is one version of a map of what we today call North America or Turtle Island, Indigenous people call it, and all of the different peoples and folks, governance system, legal system, trading routes. This is both um, a language map and a governance map of what is today considered to be the US, Canada, North American continent. This is one map, obviously maps are dodgy, but um, this is one map showing the pre-colonial language map in South America. Today, we think about South America as being one half Spanish speaking, one half uh, Portuguese. But remember, uh, many of the languages that survive today were the only languages spoken in 1400. Africa had a complex web of um, small empires and different groups. Uh, connected to different parts of the world. And, and on any given map, you'll see lots of different language groups. This is just a map of India as the British East India Company was coming in, but before the British took over. So all of the world was this remarkable patchwork quilt of bioculturalism, people who had emerged in places or moved into places living in particular ways, their own belief system, their own legal system, um, their own cultures, norms, practices, and of course, this beautiful map, um, one version of the language maps and governance system of Aboriginal Australia, another reminder that prior to colonisation, the world existed. It wasn't an empty platter ready for the taking. But in the early 1600s, folks who'd been developing certain ways of thinking for a very long time, certain ways of being interested in trade and commerce and getting that advantage whether it's the sale of spices or the sale of cotton, um, folks in uh, many of the European countries had been eyeing off other places and trying to find ways to access their resources. So it's fair enough to roughly say that uh, European colon imperialism and colonization began in the early 1600s, late 1500s. These are just some more rough maps before we talk about Australia. When you look at most maps of the European colonies of the world, you'll see that nearly all countries, not all, nearly all countries of the world have been affected by European invasion or trade or settlement or slavery. The British Empire was became one of the biggest and it's a really interesting legacy that this small country up here with its values, its beliefs, its ideas and its governance systems and cultural structures brought its ideas to many, many other places. This is a map of the British Empire um, in 1918. It's kind of the height of the red across the map. So what does it actually mean to colonize? Imperialism is about the, the powerful groups seeing themselves as having a right to take over space and to, to, uh, to be hegemonic, to dominate. Colonization is separate from imperialism, and it really does refer to large scale population movements where the migrants themselves maintain strong links to their ancestors, to their or their ancestors, former country and culture. And we'll come back to that because it's not just the movement of people to a place, it's the fact that they hang on to ideas from somewhere else uh, that can often be very, very um, traumatic for the place they move to. When colonization takes place under the protection of colonial structures, it's often termed settler colonialism. Many people argue with this term. The word settlement, which I'll mention in a moment, is very contentious. Settlement within international law um, indicated no invasion, no conflict, peaceful settlement of a place, which has probably never happened ever. And as we know, when people move from one place to another, the people who are already there um, either welcome them with open arms, they live together in harmony, or the people moving in uh, often create conflict, 
strife and difficulty, and I'm being really polite here because I don't want to be horrific on this pleasant Thursday morning, um, but it institutes legal and other structures which systematically disadvantage those who are already there for so many reasons. So very quickly, Australia's colonial history, um, I'm sure you all know this, it wasn't just about getting rid of their unwanted prisoners, but it very much was part of that. I mean, my poor ancestors who were poor people in Ireland and got done for stealing stuff, I think it was a couple of horses, um, got carted off um, hanging out in the um, the junks, the, the big old prison ships, and then eventually transported, which in those days was like being thrown in a spaceship and sent to Mars. People had no clue what was going on. The first people that the British actually colonised were the Irish. They destroyed their language. Uh, they were uh, responsible for the uh, potato famine due to land use changes and land theft. So many of the prisoners who came to Australia were poor, uh, really disadvantaged. Some of them were political prisoners. Australia's colonial history was born from the British Empire's need to have more territory. Um, it wanted to have military advantage in the region and it was also trying to get rid of its unwanted and when we think about the violence that came with the British Empire's taking of the continent, um, we often think about it as being in the past. This picture is almost acceptable. We didn't know what we were doing back in 1788, sure. But the interesting thing about colonization is it doesn't really go away. Um, and what I wanted to end my little talk with um, before handing over to Mary is that it's important to remember that all of the ideas that the British Empire brought to this continent, its governance structures and ideas, many of them are still in place. We have top-down law and power controlled by, we say elites, but um, when we think about the actual democratic structures inside Australian political uh, institutions, we know that it's very hard to have a sort of flat structure where more communities are involved in decision making that affect them. We know we have these three levels of government because of the history of the states coming first. They were the colonies. They had their own governments, their own governor, their own systems of law, and they all gave up a little bit of that power to create the federal government. So to this day, the states are extremely powerful in the Australian Western legal system, and it does preclude strong community or any Indigenous involvement in most of the parliamentary decision-making. But it's these other ideas that came to Australia that really, as we face the ecological crisis, we have to challenge the ideas that came with us, with all of the cultural baggage to this continent. The idea that nature is just property. There's no deep earth ethic in the governance systems of the British or the Australian government. Extractivism extra uh, and expansionism is still very much the way and anyone who questions that, just have a look at the space race right now. Look at the way that Westerners and other industrial countries are talking about claiming rights to water on the moon, claiming rights to minerals on Mars. There is this absolute um, assumption that they're allowed to go forth and take and extract from other worlds. And this was exactly the same ideas that meant this was a normal thing in Australia. Interestingly, the impacts on continental um, ecological health, you see all the white stuff in the map of 2016, that's phenomenal land clearing. Um, that is what the mindset that says nature is property and agriculture should be done a certain way. I'm being simplistic here, but the this is the most obvious impact of what um, British ideas about land use and then the emerging Australian views about land use have done to continent. I won't talk too much about this, but if you have a little peek on the Australian Law Reform Commission website, you will see a very interesting list of the laws that the British then Australian governments put in place to deny, destroy and control the first peoples of this continent. And one, if you've never heard of it, I strongly urge you to look up the Queensland Parliaments Act from 1897 with a stupid name, the Aboriginals Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act. This piece of law, and Mary will talk a bit more about it, was one of the most devastating deliberate ways that the Queensland government and then all the other state governments used to move Aboriginal people off country, uh, to take children away from families and so on and so forth. And it's the presence of these obvious laws in our colonial system and the ongoing impact of those laws that we still grapple with today. So I'm sure I went longer than I should have. I do apologize, but we've set the context for what is colonization? 
why is Australia the way it is today? Much of our continent um, is loved by all people do care for each other. We have some fantastic systems in place, but for indigenous people on this land, they are dealing with a legacy. And for those of us who are Westerners or from Western origins, but like me, absolutely passionately love this place. How do we do right? How do we do um, the work for caring for country and working in solidarity with others? These are the questions that haunt me every day. I'm sure many of you are interested in these issues too. Enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to Mary if she's still there and I haven't talked her into a trance. Hello, Mary. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Would, would you now like to introduce yourself <coughs> and I'll yes. bring up some of your slides. Um, oh, thank good. you so much, Mary. Okay, thank you. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, so. Um, First of all, I introduce myself. My, I'm here in Southport on the Gold Coast. This is my father's people's area, Yugambeh language um, uh, speaking people. I'm a member of uh, one particular group out of uh, half a dozen groups within this language group. Uh, Cal, um, sorry, Comba Mary. Um, on my mother's side, she was a Waka Waka person from around about Gainda in the Bernard River district, three or 400 mil kilometres northwest of uh, here. She was under the Act, that Act that um, uh, Michelle men mentioned before, but my father wasn't under that Act. Uh, so her life was, um, her status was determined by the state. So the state ran your life. Basically, they had complete control over your life. How, where you lived, how you lived, your family, um, your work, uh, your payment, if you were paid at all, and so on, your movements and so on. And not to talk too much about how horrible it was, just to, enough to say one thing always stuck in my mind. Apparently she told a story about if people were sort of uh, Aboriginal people were being cheeky back. Um, it was uh, pretty horrific for the men, but for the women, it was, um, you had your head shaved, actually, exactly like prisoners of war did, you know, uh, 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 women in uh, war camps and so on and so on, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the, uh, the one of the most interesting things about that system here, uh, as, it's, as, as uh, you saw, it was 1897 or something, and it only ended in the late 1970s here. And in that meantime, uh, after the Second World War in the late 40s, there was a um, delegation from South Africa came over on perhaps around the world, different places, looking for a perfect uh, legislative um, control system uh, to take back to their country and control the indigenous there. And so they found the perfect one in Queensland took it back over there and called it apartheid. That's the general popular uh, history of this country, of this state in particular, but of this country. Um, so as as um, as we were, set, we were saying before, um, colonialism, this, this is a modern country, modern democratic and all that sort of thing, liberal, uh, but it's actually still a colonial country. And why it's a, still a colonial country is that we wouldn't be being treated the way we are <laughs> uh, if it wasn't a colonial country. So um, that's going to be a, a hard one and very interesting uh, when um, Yin starts to talk about decolonization. Uh, but um, so those old systems, um, I was influenced by this by family by family, um, relatives, traveling around, meeting a whole lot of other Aboriginal people all around, and gradually, uh, especially setting about learning about what happened, how well, how was it that a different mob of people coming from a different place, coming in and taking over? Because in the um, general understanding was that um, not only uh, did that never happen here, uh, not invasion, um, but there were other people, of course, as people know, from the Asia, the north, coming and visiting and going backwards and forwards, trading and so on. And, of course, uh, the other culture, uh, um, the uh, Torres Strait Islands, you know, as a different culture. We don't, I don't talk about that. They have their own, um, uh, all the things that we have, exactly, dreaming stories and, and cultural heritage um, and, and so on and laws. Um, but... Um, so it, it's saying, I'm saying 
the, the generally held knowledge that we were here for a very long time. We have been here in the old um, way of thinking um, and saying, as Aboriginal people have said, we haven't come from anywhere else, even though the science says that we've come from somewhere else, ancient, ancient human beings, you know, two million years old or something like that. All that long progress of development, human development, uh, human um, migration, all sorts of stuff. And, um, but here are an ancient mob who've been here, the conservative scientific thing is around about 60, 65,000 apparently. Um, but uh, whether we've been here for that long or, or, or not, or as long as the science says, uh, the, the main thing is that the Aboriginal people say we don't come from anywhere else because you could prove it scientifically, I suppose, or, or whatever, but it's in the dreaming stories. There are no, not very many dreaming stories about, say, monkey dreaming or elephant dreaming, nothing. They're all flora and fauna um, about here, our cosmo, cosmo, cosmological too, um, insects, you name it. They're all stories that come only from this place here, you know. Um, uh, so without going further into the um, uh, the ancient part, uh, in a strange way, you could also look at it like uh, the science is actually correct. Because this is what we say, the land invented us, Aboriginal people. Uh, the land actually created us, not like a god of some sort, but uh, actually created us literally out of the earth, you know. And literally, that's what science says. And the big difference probably is that we sacralized it, like most Indigenous people around the world. We sacralized that whole story, that whole process. And it's lasted there for, for years and years and years. You know? um, and it's true that people have been in those places for a very long time. Um, plus, what came out of it, the very first thing, is this a relationalist foundation towards our connection with land. So it goes like that land has created us. It looks after us, continues to look after us um, with all kinds of phys physical things, of course, but eventually it gives us meaning in life. So in a, in a word, just to put an end to that part of the whole thing, um, it's a sacralized ecological collaborative stewardship system because that's where what our obligations are. We've got to look after the place because it's looked after us continually forever and ever. Uh, and it wasn't turned into a religion. I prefer the word, um, there's another word, a worldview, because it's not a, a religion, or it's got elements of religion. It's not an ideology either, but it's got some great ideas, <laughs> actually notions within it. Um, and it's not even a philosophy, not in the European sense. It's a philosophy in this other sense of a worldview. There's a German word called Weltanschauung, uh, which means that it's very, very complex, deep meaning of uh, a worldview. So when you look at that Angli uh, sorry, the uh, language map, what you're actually also looking at is a, is a governance map, actually. No empty land, no wild land. Um, uh, no um, land that wasn't originally um, being looked after by somebody, one of these hundreds of groups. Mm -hmm. So it's a governance system. And because it's a system, that's what makes it a civilization, of course. But not uh, not a civilizational state. It's a civilizational cult culture because it's very so old. They already worked out um, what a good friend of mine, colleague, calls um, – a long-term experiment in human order making. And that's exactly what governance, my opinion of governance is much broader than that, but it's order making actually. How to try and achieve some form of, through rules, for some form of um, stability. And that's what they um, really aimed for as far as I can understand it. Uh, again, as I said, learning from um, family, relatives, traveling around, reading as much as I could about, um, you know, all these other different senses of um, governance, other countries. Why do uh, some countries feel the need um, to go and invade other people? Uh, you know, um, 
uh, a long time ago. Why did they do that? Where did imperialism, going way back, you know, to big em empires like the Romans, um, carrying on all through, right through the beginning of the uh, the state, you know, um, all kinds of development like that. And still today, and it, it's amazing when you think of it, still today, invading other people and stealing their wealth goes on. It just carries on. It just changed its nature, its system, that's all. Um, but our own old system, um, it starts off with relationalism and there's survivalism. So two different ways of looking at how do we connect with each other and with land and, and so on. So relationalism, the um, main attributes of relationalism is autonomy. We are all autonomous beings, all of us. Uh, but that out there is autonomous too. It's its own boss. It owns itself. And uh, we're seeing that as clear as day now with climate change. But what's going on all around the world, it definitely owns itself. We can't control it, you know. Um, but they haven't realised, didn't realise that for only now it's the realisation has come. So autonomous and the way of operating with each other is autonomous regard. And autonomy is not the... Um, generally held idea of being a, a law unto yourself. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm my own boss. I can treat anybody the way I like and so on and so on. Um, but the way of operating is this idea of regard. I prefer the word regard. Um, and there's a, a, in our own language, uh, Garamagul, uh, Yulin, um, it's, it's like that. It's very deep respect, which is regard. Because respect, you know, mutual respect is a, you know, it's something um, in passing, you know, it's it, to me, it always seems a bit softer, whereas autonomous regard determines and says, I am my own boss, but I recognising it, you, you own yourself too. Uh, you, you know, and we, we are both autonomous beings relating uh, with regard to each other. And it's, it seems as if that's what we worked on for a very long time. And of course, it goes without saying that women are definitely autonomous beings. They are their own boss, which is why there is such a thing as women's business, spirituality, um, um, all kinds of stuff. I even believe uh, myself, I, I'm working on this with others, um, that gender uh, is, uh, sorry, our logic is gendered actually too, but uh, we'll see what comes out. Um, so autonomy, balance, uh, gendered, or governance, a gendered governance, men and women run society, they actually do. Um, and the other interesting uh, balance I see, uh, which would do with more in investigating or researching and so on, or think just simply thinking about, um, is the two big things that all human, all human beings, all human um, societies had to figure out, what to do about power and what to do about authority, what kinds of power, what understanding power, and then what forms of authority should you have. Most ancient societies, they have uh, authority and power conflated like that. So the people who have the power, they also have the authority to run that society, the whole populations, the way they like, whatever they like. You know, It seems as if we did something quite unique and I always think quite brilliant, we seem to separate authority and power. So we didn't end up with straight hierarchies, which comes from conflated authority and power. You have a hierarchy. So you end up with a flat system or a heterarchy, the uh, political uh, theory says, or a lateral system, if you like, um, where authority and power are separated, but within reach, you know, uh, and authority are knowledgeable people not necessarily only an exclusively grey-haired, white-haired people, um, could be very young, quite young, but knowledgeable, knowledgeable and seeking knowledge. Um, you could say that old saying about a, um, an old head on young shoulders, you know, someone who's old before their time or mature before their time and so on, and they want to be, you know, to um, be a... Um, a, a um, um, like older people, I suppose, knowledgeable. So older, those experienced people, they have a quantity of knowledge, great knowledge about laws, about history, culture, you name it. <clears throat> a quantity of um, experience, 
they've experienced either you know what wars battles um um violence um experienced everything so two lots of big things knowledge and experience but they also have an idea about what principled uh, a principled ethical kind of uh, systems what does that mean to have um uh, systems like that how do you how do you look at it you know um and that that is very important to try and figure out what's the best uh system to have that aims for stability stability rather than security stability it's it works in a back to front way in a way um power um um, sorry, <clears throat> authority is more powerful than power when it comes down to it, really, because real authority, you don't have to order people around, actually. They just simply know what they do, what to do, which is how over this long period of time we end up, ended up with an old system which is self-regulating, self-regulating, which is why we never needed a state, a state, as everybody with a small s, a state uh, that organises and controls harshly or not, uh, their, their populations. Um, so we never had anything, we need, never needed a state. So no hierarchy, uh, no uh, one tribe or gathering of tribes that order everybody else about, uh, no rulers or ruled, no, um, um, what do you call it, a command obedience kind of system, nothing at all. Uh, a, a, um, a self-regulating system. Uh, also with that stability, and this is one of the things that really helped with the stability, we worked out how to, how, uh, that conflict is natural. It's a normal human activity. The ego, hatred, jealousy, blah, blah, blah. It all, it, you, you can never do anything about it because it's a part of our very being, our, our you know, heart and brain and, and so on and so on. So you have to work out really good ways of managing conflict, which is what Blackfellas did over this long period of time. And one of the most important things was don't have wars of conquest. In other words, don't go around invading other people's country. Don't do that. You will never have security. And I must say, not that I've read every dreaming story. I haven't because there's thousands and thousands of them. But I have yet to come across a dreaming story where one group actually invades and takes over the land. And you, you wonder how, how could people even resist doing that over this period of time? You know, Well, it all depends, of course, going back to that relationless connection with land. Um, there's a saying, um, old French philosopher, Descartes, Everybody might be familiar with it. Um, your, um, I think, therefore I am. If we had an equivalent of that, we don't. But if we did, it'd be something like, I am located, therefore I am. So meaning arises from a place you come from via mother and father, of course. Mother's people's country, father's people's country. You are anchored in two places all the time. And that old system keeps going, kept kept going, and still very important today. Um, if you know anything about native title, you probably don't, but that would be a very clear example of uh, what uh, how upsetting native title was and it is, actually. Um, we've got a different logic. We've we we don't have a Aristotelian logic, not at all. Uh, you know, Aristotle, if anybody's done, they used to have logic in high school, you know, when I was going to high school. Um, so three main rules. He's the guy who wrote the book for the Europeans, for the Greeks, really, but all of Europeans take it up, took it on, you know. Uh, the excluded middle. Uh, that's a favourite one, excluded middle. Um, either you're a friend, anything beginning, sentence beginning with either or. Either you're a friend of the Americans or you're an enemy. You can't be... You can't sit on the fence any longer. You can't be non-aligned. You're not allowed to by the hegemon. You can either choose one side or the other. And that'll determine the future of your, yourself and your country, actually. Um, the other rules are uh, uh, law of um, contradiction or non-contradiction and law of identity. One of those, uh, that, uh, that one, the last one, um, it starts off, again, these sentences you can go by. Um, all red-haired people are mad. I know Miss Jones, she's got red hair, she must be mad. All um, 
Aboriginal people are drunk and violent. That's the first premise. Second premise supports that. You end up with a conclusion that confirms those two things. Perfect, perfect logic for um, or what do you call it? Um, what you see in the newspaper every day and in the news. Um, I can't think of that word. Uh, propaganda. propaganda. No, no, propaganda. Yep. The perfect logic for propaganda. If you want to, if you hear de demonising of a country or people or a person, for that matter, you know they're using Aristotelian logic. The other one is the if-then argument. If something or other, something or other, then or therefore something or something. Aboriginal people don't have a logic like that. Uh, not at all. And it's nothing wrong with those logics, even that either or. If you like um, police shows, <laughs> like I do, uh, a forensic investigator has to determine whether the murdered body in front of him is either uh, is either John um, John Smith or not. Either or. That's when that logic works. It works. Um, uh, if you try and do that with politics or any other kind of thing, well, it doesn't, it gets, but you can try, but it gets a bit murky, you know. So our logic is based on here, this map here. Um, not many people have done things on uh, Aboriginal logic, actually, but uh, I see it as in this, when you see, have multiple places, multiple communities, you know, multiple, that means every place has got its own dreaming story. And sometimes they're overlapping because a lot of it depends on flora and fauna in different parts of the country, you know. Um, so uh, dreaming story, th this is why there's no, you know, lion, lion dreaming or <laughs> anything like that, only of things like here. But also um, the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, um, just... Could I just hold it for a minute? Absolutely, Mary. You got something on it now? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just, um, oh, sorry. It's okay, I'll mute you. Yes, um, the joys of working from home, folks. Every now and then our families need us um, or interrupt us or people come to the door. So, um, so just a reminder, if you have questions or things you want to challenge, Mary loves a good uh, pro provocation, please do write them in the chat um, and we'll have time, a little bit of time at the end for discussions um, but I do want to also give a plug for the fact that Future Dreaming hosts a range of workshops throughout the year, uh, online um, and more and more in person. So if you do have burning questions for Mary, you sorry. yourself, and you don't have time, we can get back to them. No worries, Mary. I'm just oh, filling sorry. time with cheerful yeah. ramble. No? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, our logic. Yes. Our logic really basically copies all those uh, places. So every dreaming a uh, dreaming story. Um, and remember, there's not one per place. There might be several per place, you know, and they overlap. Um, and the law, L-A-W-L-O-R-E, is made up of, um, uh, is mixed up with that dreaming. That's where it comes from, basically. Um, so hundreds of them. Um, uh, a law, L-A-W, both of them, uh, is a truth. You could argue it's like a truth for that place. The truth about life comes from a particular position or location in land. And that may or may not be quite different or a little bit different from the next door neighbour one. And the last the last one is a perspective. There are literally hundreds of places, so there are hundreds, if not thousands, of perspectives. You know? And the equivalent is all perspectives are valid and reasonable, essentially. Um, so that's why we have a, a, um, a custodial ethos. You, you couldn't have a logic like that without having a custodial ethos they go together they mix together they're entangled um just like a st uh, what I, what i was talking about before a stewardship system so a general stewardship system and you have differences between people and but there's no one basic thing that's right one area that overrides others um the last thing i guess is um Gee, um, um, what was I going to say? Um, technology, I suppose. Um, Yin, you might be remember that one of the oldest uh, racist insults that blackfellas used to get, or maybe they still do. Um, we are Aboriginal people are so backward, primitive, savage, and so on. We didn't even we didn't even discover the wheel. 
we're so backward, you know. Um, and the person, that, people who think like that, forget very easily that other cultures didn't have, actually have wheels either, you know. <laughs> so you know, they're not very, you know, not thinking clearly. Um, but it it is all to do with um, uh, old um, agriculture, large scale agriculture. It's all there in. Um, those wonderful books now by Bruce Pascoe and Bill Gamage, how Aboriginal people actually literally ran the country, um, you know, looked after it and so on. But large-scale agriculture in the old old ancient places gave rise, this is 12, 13,000 years ago or so, gave rise to big empires, which gave rise to very strong states, which gave rise to competitiveness, permanent, permanent competitiveness. They took it outside their own, you know, went, um, um, aimed along, you know, along for a hundred centuries um, and then right up to today, which um, this is how long this system has um, worked. Um, hegemonic rulers or wannabe hegemonic rulers throughout the centuries want to con control uh, all their surrounding areas. And then they decided to get into sailboats and sail around the world and do the same thing. And the main aim was not just um, general nastiness, go and go and invade and you know um, eliminate eliminate those people. It was really for resources. The big thing is who owns and controls all the resources in the world, and that hasn't stopped. That's it started a long time ago. Um, you know, uh, way back when everyone was uh, foraging hunter-gatherers and then this newfangled thing called farming comes into it and it's all downhill from there i don't really mean that uh but but humongous change humongous change happens uh and that hasn't changed right to today that is what it's what are all these wars and battles are about around the world because invading just never stops invading either either a long time ago with sailboats and so on and so on or with um, modern jets uh, invade and bomb that country. It's just going on and on. Uh, and it's all like normalized actually. Um, and it is all about who controls all these things. Um, so Aboriginal people never had to go through that. You could argue, you could argue um, that, well, no wonder we didn't go through it. We're so isolated. All those wars and battles that happened in other cultures, uh, sorry, other uh, geographical areas, you know, um, an invasion by one mob who has to move, displaces uh, the mob that they they invade, they have to move and they displace people. It, it mightn't be a human oriented thing, it might be um, real natural things, natural crises, uh, things like uh, the plague, you know, plagues, things like that, they always happen. Um, natural things like earthquakes and volcanoes, somehow, somewhere throughout the world, uh, and and here to do with natural crises, people were on the run, you know, fleeing. You had to work out how you live with other people, and so on and so on. And uh, and it stayed like that basically, you know. So so that's where the survivalist ethos comes in. Survivalism is small scale stuff. Um, uh, you've got to watch yourself crossing the road. You might get hit by a bus. Uh, large scale, all of those big crises, war, pandemics, and so on and so on. It all depends. The, the ethos is how people can, um, how can they um, stand it, how they cope with it. If they end up with a pretty well relationalist coping, okay. Um, but if they don't, um, they might end up with a very hard line view. The world is... The world is a, it's a dog eat dog world. There's nobody I can trust or have faith in. Nothing at all. It's a hard life and so on. So you still hate people or so on and so on. All that goes. That's a survivalist ethos. And I would say my own it's my own only own opinion is that people who love war are survivalist survivalist ethos people. They see the world as something to be won or lost, you know, and so on. Yeah. I think I might leave it there. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of other little things, Absolutely. little little things, but um, huge things. Yeah, huge things. Like like this is a country that never had any um, no um self. Uh, what do you call them? Domesticatable animals. No horses. No cattle. 
That's why we never had cow's milk. We, we had never been used to cow's uh, uh, milk, only mother's milk, of course, uh, but no cow's milk. Uh, no buffaloes, like uh, buffaloes in Asia, they're used, you know, like properly in that way. Um, no elephants, no camels, no transhumance animals, you know, herding animals. The great, um, the old Sami, you know, in the coal country. Thousands of deer over thousands of years. No sheep, no goats, no pigs, no alpacas, no, what's the name, nothing at all that you could turn into an industry. It's, a, it's as if the spirit said, well, there you go. Now now go for it. <laughs> See what you can do. <laughs> here, here are creatures that hop away but, whenever you try to control them. So learn how to live in a non-controlled way. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, lovely. Leave, uh, leave it's it. just wonderful to listen to you, Mary. And um, we'll now turn to Yin and um, we'll see how we go with time at the end. So um, there have been some lovely comments in there, Mary. If you read the chat, you'll see lots of people thanking you and provoking wow. new thoughts. So yes, yes. Again. Mm. Um, and I can't stress enough, if you look up YouTube, there's a lot of Mary's talks are on YouTube. You can find them on the Future Dreaming website under her profile. We've got a lot of her publications and um, a long talk about the relations to ethos uh, that we recorded last year, I think. So So thank you again, Mary, and we'll be thank right you. back to you. So thank you. Thanks. And so then much. it's my great pleasure to now introduce Yin, who's been patiently standing in a forest somewhere um, ready to talk to us. How are oh, you? Oh, no. No, sit, he's happy. Sit so. down. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I am sorry. Actually, yeah. I am also in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, I'd thank love, you. Yes, hand over to you. Thanks, love. Thanks. Um, I'll just start by um, acknowledging that I'm on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. I live, work, and play. And uh, I just wanted to make a point first about this business of technology that Mary was talking about. What people don't realize is that uh, Aboriginal people were actually at the forefront of technological development in the ancient world. So uh, we were the first bread makers in the world with evidence of a 32,000 year old grindstone held in the Australian Museum. Uh, we were the first miners in the world. There was a mine in Western Australia, worked to a depth of 20 meters for up to 40,000 years producing about 14,000 cubic meters of ochre during that time. We made pottery 3,000 years ago. We were the first to create ground edge atlas technology, the first use of complex harvesting tools 50,000 years ago. So just to be aware that there's a lot of bullshit out there and uh, that Aboriginal people weren't excellent technologists is one of those bullshit stories. Now, I'm going to share screen and I've got some slides. So I don't have a lot of time, but I'll talk about some of these topics. First of all, modernity. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of the impending uh, catastrophe that's unfolding at the moment. You might have a sense of that already. And if you don't, you'll figure it out pretty soon. Uh, six mass extinction, climate, climate derangement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet underneath all that, there's still a story from many people that everything is awesome, that there is such a thing as progress and development and advancement and that industrial consumer technology and societies are awesome. That's a kind of story that you'll get. Now, there's no amount of evidence that will convince some people that that story is absolute rubbish. That's the sort of thing that we're dealing with at the moment. So what are the underlying features of modernity or coloniality, colonial modernity? These are very similar ideas um, drawing from what Michelle was talking about. But they are worldviews or philosophies, and Mary talked about some of the differences between those two terms, that go back a long way, but well before 1400. So I'm taking us back to uh, about 10,000 years ago. About 10,000 years ago, all societies on Earth more or less had many of those features of indigenous societies that Mary was talking about. And then something changed in the third old crescent uh, in the Middle East. And slowly we have got to the point that we are in now. And some of the key worldviews, philosophies uh, of modern societies, which as I said, haven't have a 
origin quite a number of thousands of years ago are things like this separatism mind body and emotions are separate uh very sp specific ideas of time as linear as chronically deficient or at least um in short supply and these uh, these ideas developed over different periods of time so some of them are quite recent some of them are quite old ideas of self-improvement ideas of universalism and competition and hierarchy so hierarchy was probably one of the first uh practices and ideas that were um put into societal widespread use some thousands of years ago linear clock time is quite new that's only a couple of hundred years old and that leads us to the sort of situation that we find ourselves in now where we have societies based on these sorts of things quantification and objectivity rationalism and reductionism continuity and determinism standardization and systemization weaponization not just of actual weapons but of discourse of propaganda as mary talked about instrumentalization through terms like resources natural resources human resources and an obsession with abstraction anonymity modularity and force these are some of the key features of modern societies many of which have developed over hundreds and thousands of years and as i mentioned before this idea of separation is very key to the basis of coloniality or modernity separation of various parts of ourselves from each other somehow we are separate from nature as well apparently uh ideas of unrestricted autonomy entitlement merit inno merit innocence unceasing growth the slide that uh, michelle showed us progress accumulation acquisition infinite growth on a finite planet these sorts of things and an obsession with certainty surety mastery and control uh, that are very fundamental to our societies and drive very simplistic solutions to complex predicaments we have a uh, approach that's about artificial scarcity profit hierarchy very deeply in, enmeshed in our societies individualism of a certain sort there's a good form we have a bad form exploitation competition vast amounts of co-modification of everything and also a lot of comparison judgment condemnation and alienation are central to modern societies all these sorts of emotional uh expressions that are out of out of kilter out of balance and this has brought us to the situation that we find ourselves in now which is basically the end of our society as we know it uh what more specifically can be called the ending of industrial consumer modes of sustenance shelter health security pleasure identity and meaning that began in 2015 by all accounts uh, with the data that we have available and can be seen through unprecedented declines in crop yields quality of life expectancy health income education trust in government and energy return on investment uh, for fossil fuels and so forth of course ecosystems are very much in decline as well and so we're we've passed um carrying capacity and we are getting close to um a precipitous fall so having said all that that's coloniality that's where we're at what can we do to decolonize our thinkings feelings and actions so the four H's of decolonization found humility very much needed radical honesty with ourselves mostly with others when it's safe consistent hyper self-reflexivity that is a really important uh, skill to practice to cultivate listening to yourself basically understanding what's happening with you is essentially antithetical to the way we are raised to be human in modern societies expensive sense of humor and crying laughing and crying uh, it's all going to be called for so decolonization is about heart-based and gut-based being thinking and doing rather than head-based so we're very much in the head in colonial modernity and even there we're only in half the head because we are very much driven by left brain uh modes of operating our right brain is essentially shut down 
most of the time in modernity. So experiencing a shared psychic intertwined existence scape rather than a narcissistic ego-based world. That's what decolonization is about. Dwelling within the eternal spirit substance flow of life rather than an anxiety-ridden algorithmic, if then, infinite flow charting of mere living. So we didn't rehearse this before, but the if-then statements that uh, Mary talked about are exactly part of the problem. That sort of logic, Aristotelian logic. So the, the world, the cosmos, is not only literal, logical, causal, rational, and factual, but actually also mysterious, mystical, mythical, magical, metaphorical, multitudinous, and musical. Other decolonial tips, uh, going from rushing to slowing down, from seriousness to lightheartedness, from creating a new to noticing existing wisdom and innovation, as including the innovation I just mentioned in Aboriginal Australia, from needing everyone in the room to repairing and renewing existing relations. You can have these slides later. There's some very interesting references to follow up in more detail. So decolonial perspectives are about understanding that nothing is complete, perfect, or enduring, but all is alive, sentient, profoundly relational, and deeply sacred. We are immersed in mysterious worlds, which we can learn to perceive, inhabit, co-mingle, and grow with. We are invited to outgrow the often unquestioned obligation to obey, as Mary talked about, orders and obeying. That's Western, colonial, uh, mod modern stuff. We don't have that in Aboriginal cultures. Conform, judge, and repress, which stunts our ability to express, create, connect, and play. We are called to conscious, embodied, loving, reverent, co-liberation with each other within the spontaneous, emergent, complex, self-organizing, living cosmos. So D, this means disinvesting from things like reductionism, truth, rightness, power over, ambition, affirmation, success, perfection, certainty, control, coherence, mastery, progress, virtue, fame, validation, heroism, merit, entitlement, and some forms of duty and sacrifice. What could life look like beyond exceptionalism, exploitation, extraction, consumption, growth, and human hubris in the way we do it now? What would happen if we embrace the immense joy that comes from forgetting who we think we are, who we are told we are, who we're made to believe that we are, and instead sense the gift of not only being what we imagine ourselves to be? Yin, your sound has gotten a little soft. Can you, I don't know what's happening. Can you hear me? Yeah, just speak up, love. It's fading, but coming back. <laughs> I heard the human brain is shrinking. Please continue. The human brain has shrunk in the last 3,000 years because we live in modernity and hierarchical pyramid-based societies are simplistic and simplified. And so we don't need a bigger brain. And yes, there is a correlation between brain size and intelligence for those people who uh, doubt that. Yes good studies on that so this is the situation that we're in and what we can do about that is many things um, mostly around um, changing the way we think be and do but more practically relocalizing into smaller communities uh, relinquishing ideas of debt money private property institutions rejecting competitive success uh, participating more in life in its various forms um, in conscious, frugal, simple, sufficient, joyful pleasure, and adopting Indigenous principles of how to do things. So Indigenous societies are very much about how, they're process-oriented. They're societies in which the ends never justifies the means. The means, in fact, are the ends, always. So that's about creating circles, not lines, humility, deep listening, planning, designing with, collaborating, collaborating, representing, very importantly, moving at the time of trust, centering lived experience and seeking knowledge and, and wisdom. What if we stop trying to solve global problems by scaling up standardized solutions? What would it mean to accept ourselves unconditionally exactly as we are while staying wide open to growth? How can we invite material conditions and social relations which are conducive to life, beauty, and thrive? We can build it's love, courage, and truth while opening our hearts to those whose views and actions are profoundly objective. 
can we enjoy life's resonances, vibrations, textures, thrummings, roilings, secretions, and emanations as we deepen our vulnerability? To Yin, suffering? you're very soft again, my dear. I'm sorry to interrupt you, love. Just very soft. Yeah. It's probably just the wind. It may be the wind. It could be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about now? Yeah, thank you. One of the important things about being outside is you're not the only one who's allowed to speak. You have to listen to everything else as well. <laughs> so nourishing societies are about connecting with ourselves, as I mentioned. Very important part of the story. Your appetites, thoughts, feelings, emotions, moods, desires, sensations, yearnings, longings, yieldings, repulsions, callings, instincts, hunches, inklings, and needs. Particularly needs. It's about being present in the world, essentially. That's what decolonization is about as well. Um, offering self into the world as it is without demanding acceptance, welcoming change, transformation, catharsis, intensity, rupture, but also having boundaries and limits in particular time places, contextualized to the places where you are. Meeting others with curiosity, courage, vulnerability, love, honesty, and humility, sensing visceral needs behind actions, learning and growing with gratitude, connection and cultivation, but minimizing correction, attending to beauty, wonder, and grace, especially in some pretty hard times that we find ourselves in and we'll find ourselves increasingly in. Last few slides. This is about slowing, pausing, resting, sleeping more, idling, lulling, shedding, catalyzing, channeling, dueling, delving, guiding, the unknowable, the uncertain, the, un the imperceptible. It's about unique mistakes beyond nature, evidence shadow work in many ways if people know what that is and it's about doing more with your right brain so more than just judgment comparison justification logic literality rationality it's more sensing interdependence feeling into feeling, sensing Uh, you can read more in that paper. Yin, you're very soft again. I'm so sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Uh, lost you just for that last slide. slide. This is a slide you could read more about. And I'll post something in the chat about an online course in November. And we're done. Thank you, Yin. Oh, my gosh. That was a, a head full of awesomeness. Um, thank you so much. Um, Yin, just before we go to some of the questions, would you be able to bring up the, I think it's the process slide, you know, the black slide with the white frames? A couple of folks have asked questions about that one. Um, uh, firstly, Claire was wondering uh, where it's from so that she can look it up, if that's yours or if it's um, referenced from somewhere else. They would love to know more. That's it, the create circles. I think that's it. can't hear you at the moment i shall wait for the wind to let you come back to us i've posted the source in the chat okay he has posted the source of this into the chat um now another question um was someone was asking um where can we read or find out more about how to do this stuff <laughs> and maybe that's something that future dreaming and yin can get together and, and actually have further yarns about but yin how can people learn more about um, these ideas? Well, they can come to my course in November. They can read the paper. Ah, uh, I can't hear you, love. Um, Maybe just yell. Sing. You should be able to hear me. I don't know what's happened. Can you hear me now? Yes, a little better. Okay. Um, they can come to my course in November. Excellent. They can uh look at the references in these slides and i'm willing to provide any further readings if you email me um wonderful there's a lot of options fabulous yin we will um make sure that we could yeah um if you want to stop sharing screen yep thank you very much yin um, yeah deadly yeah mary did you have any questions for yin before i open up to some questions from our participants um Only, only one, but it's it's partly. Um, oh, I I loved everything you said. I just absolutely, I couldn't go agree more. But I'm wondering about an old problem that um, 
I was reading some old stuff the other day from a guy called um, Emile Césaire. You remember? Do you know? I mean, one of those old 1960s, like Franz Fanon, you know, talking about that. Yeah. Well, but this guy, uh, Césaire, Yeah, I know him. oh, yeah, yeah you, you, um, he, he brought together, which I've been thinking, um, uh, I've, I agree with and thought of for a long time, that there's not much of a difference. Well, they are different, but they're different purposes, I suppose, between uh, colonialism and fascism. I believe that colonialism was carried out. It's it, uh, Colonialism is um, almost like an institution, you know, or it has institutions, I should say, museums, statues, paintings of great, you know, all that, that big map with the pink all over it, you know what I mean, and things like that. Um, but fascism is a method of how you get get <laughs> colonialism going. Do you know what I mean? And if some countries are still colonial, like here, well, you can see examples of fascism quite often, putting 10-year-old Aboriginal kids, only Aboriginal kids, into jails. Um, just recently, uh, how different states, Queensland especially, uh, you know, <clears throat> getting rid of the... Um, or suspending the Human Rights Act in order to do even worse things to black mm -hmm. fellows. So what, what I'm saying is um, all those things you you listed, that that is fantastic and absolutely spot on and right for a general improvement uh, for a very young country like this, um, yeah, white country, uh, to get more mature, to grow a bit, to grow in themselves and so on and so on. Um, but the but bits and pieces of fascism carry on. Do you, do you, I mean? Do you have any idea? Like how how could you do that? How could you con, kind of confront that? Apart from what's going on at the moment, you know the yes no, um, all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Do you have any idea? Yeah, well, I don't have any. I'm not saying it uh, myself. You know. Hmm. I would quickly say that you know fascism, fascism is pretty much foundational to modernity and colonial societies mm. in various degrees and mm. because it's linked to hierarchy and, mm. and it's actually linked to what the difference is between aboriginal societies which have uh, a certain strength in unity mm -hmm. autonomy and autonomous regard and strong individualism of a sort as you well mm. know yes. um, but fascism fascism takes strength and unity and turns it into strength and uniformity Mm, yeah, that's right. That's good luck. That's exactly yeah. what modernity does as well. Mm, mm. Can I comment too, as a non-Indigenous person, watching governments continue to railroad what's been shown to be public popular interest and will with regard to the environment, everything from allowing new coal mines to allowing lend-lease to trash koala habitat, this endlessness of the top-down state-centred hierarchical decision making in this country um certainly for my 35 years of working um on the ground with people mm. trying to protect place it's an endless litany of mm. control from above and i certainly mm. see that as a kind of fascism if other people really have no input um, mm. another example the queensland government just released the southeast queensland regional plan a 270 page document and gave people 30 days to reply and respond and share their <laughs> thoughts. For most people, it's going to take them longer than that to read the damn thing. So yes. decision-making, mm. and I don't know if it's a true definition of fascism, but the decision-making processes in this country are definitely, you know, not fit for purpose mm -hmm. um, in the complexity of, of, of what we face mm. today. Mm. Yes. I will just say one thing, that, that what fascism isn't, so well, there's been a lot of people accused of fascism. It's like a popular thing. You're a fascist. No, you're a fascist. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. People exercising their own autonomy. So mm. if yes. I say mm. I don't want to be, if I say I don't want a COVID vaccine, you don't call me fascist because that's not yeah. fascist. Yeah, Just exactly. Clear, for people who don't get that. And and, and, not... and if people say I don't want you to come in and destroy the rainforest that we live next to or live in, um, yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, Thank you, lovelies. I'm just going to go to a couple of questions. Um, there were two people who actually asked if they could find out a little bit more about how Aboriginal people um, handle conflict between groups, the way you mentioned, Mary. And then there was another question about the logic. So perhaps, Mary, if you'd like to talk a bit about the protocols and the, the rules. I remember you telling me about the mother-in-law rule, you know, the, mm -hmm. the preventative measures 
people talk to manage conflict. Then we Ooh. might come back and both of you might want to talk about logic. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's a bit it is a bit difficult to say because the first thing you have to realise is it's different all over the whole country. Do you know what I mean? This mob living somewhere, you know, might be quite different to how they do. There's no uniformity. Talking about uniformity, there's nothing like that in the, in a in a sense like that, except to say um, that it is a natural thing, um, and that might sound. Um, I remember being in a conference with my good friend Lilla and uh, the father of peace studies, uh, Galtong, his name was, he was talking about the, it is possible, arguing for, yes, you can have uh, absolute peace. No, yeah, you can have absolute anything, but um, peace, you know, I don't know about that. Anyway, we disagree. Well, we didn't openly disagree either. <laughs> we didn't turn it into an argument. We just said a few things about, you know, that blackfellas would see it as quite normal to, you lose your temper and you, you know what I mean? Your ego, you, we do have all this. Um, and that funny behind me, or oh, well, not behind us, next to us, we could see all these people, non-European, all agreeing with us, you know, <laughs> mainly all Europe, not Europeans, they're all there, everybody else agreeing with us. Um, because there's this understanding what the, what the vulnerabilities and the limitations of uh, people you know, are, do you know? So more, more, um, more concentration on having really, really good methods of managing it. So we just manage it. You don't look at solving it or anything like that. And if it can't be solved, um, I, you know, uh, various things. In in a moment, I'm talking about. Uh, I grew up with somebody saying, uh, argument breaks out, and then it gets more and more pushing and shoving and so on and so on. It gets a bit um, feisty. Um, and then somebody says, uh, "Oh, let them go." Let them, let them go, let them, let them fight it out. So it's a boiling point. There's a boiling point, and then you've got to let it go, and you have to allow it to happen, but with no, um, for example, no weapons, unless it is a proper duel. You know what I mean? With a weapon, you know, there are there are umpteen numbers of rules around it, umpteen numbers of rules. Um, there is even a place for fighting. So every which way they handled it. Do you know, and even um, that thing about not taking over other people's countries. So you could fight with someone who you just you just never did like them. They're, they're fools, you know, or whatever. You know, yes, they have a fight and so on. But at the end of it, uh, whichever the protagonist, whichever wins or loses, uh, the winner doesn't um, put upon himself uh, as a, well. He'll reward himself with taking some of that one's land or some of their resources, something like that. You're not allowed to do anything, right? You have a fight, and then you go back to your place, your your ring. This smart uh, smart little um, student I had, you mean it's like a boxing match, he said. <laughs> and I had to laugh, and I said, well, it is a bit, actually. <laughs> you you fight, and then it's your face is saved. You know, yes, honour is yeah. saved. And so, right, so you break up, and you go back to your... And, and, and no, nothing more so no no wars of conquest but fighting is you know you, you have a fight you, somebody once described it like a, it's like a, an Italian opera you know without the singing and sometimes they're singing there too. but but it is a bit like that dire threats going across the room you know and somebody offering someone out and all that and all the peacemakers are trying to make keep peace I've seen it my working in native title and they're brilliant, brilliant people. They can talk down, talk it all down, you know. Yeah. So there's all sorts of different ways. I don't know, Yin, if, I don't know if you've got experiences yeah. or <laughs> growing up watching stuff. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. And and the thing about <laughs> conflict is that it's um, it's just more distributed. It's more egalitarian in its nature. And there's ritualized yes. forms of violence, like you said, with lots ritualized. of mm. guidelines. Mm. Violence mm. is also distributed. It's not hierarchical, yeah. and it's not it's not feared. As I said it's not feared in the same way as in Western no. cultures. Um, it's okay mm. to have a bit of violence mm. because it's distributed and egalitarian. Mm. And a lot of um, indigenous cultures are very uh, indirect anyway. In the way, I mean, things can boil over, but at the start, there's a lot of um, mm. space given to people. Um, you know, a lot of indirect discussion of conflict. Mm, mm. Uh, mm. stuff up around a campfire. Mm. 
losing you a bit again, yes. Yin, just so you know. The wind is taking your space. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, I just wanted could, to mention... You can oh, tell yes. stories you know, that are about... Yes. Just to finish. Yeah. You can tell stories that are about other people. And that's a form of conflict resolution. You don't have to directly like confront people all the time. Yes, okay. that's right. It's, it's amazing, I reckon. Eh? It's subtle. There's a great yeah. subtlety there too. You Actually, know? Mary and Yin, I mean, that, that's a beautiful comment. You can tell stories about how other people have handled it but not attack, attack it directly. And to me, that's mm -hmm. certainly as an outsider, non-Indigenous person, when I look at many of the simplified dreaming stories, it really is telling stories about how mm. people handled conflict, how someone mm. dealt with Absolutely. the punish. And, and, Mary, you've often said that the dreaming stories are often about second laws, those laws between people because oh, you'd, yeah. already worked, you'd already worked out the first laws, land mm. comes from, uh, land is the source of the law. No one takes each other's land. We're all settled in. And then mm. the rest of the, the interaction stories, at least, are about how yes. to behave. Yeah. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Fascinating. I, I'm, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they must have understood psychology long ago, long ago, what you can take, what a pe person, people can take, mm. cope with or limit, you know. Mm. And Mary, um, I, I was trying to remember in the book that we're working on together, there's this beautiful quote. It's in one of your articles too. Ego was managed like a volatile substance. Is that? Is oh, that yeah. That one. Yeah. Substance? Yeah. I remember yes, thinking right. about that. Like we have a society that just mm. everyone's allowed to unleash their self. Mm. Mm. Um, but in, you were saying in, in you know traditional culture, the idea of not mm. being too big for your boots and remembering mm. collective interests and not, yeah. you know, your individual is defined by where you belong mm. in the group. And it's a really yeah. good way of thinking. Everybody has a place. But the best one I've come across, uh, Yin, was the one where I think Marcia Langton wrote it in one of her books, I think, I'm not quite sure, but where someone can... Um, now, what do you call it on stage when you're giving a big uh, uh, speech, you know? Um, I forget what it's called now. Uh, but anyway, that eh? what? And standing? Yeah, no. Um, diatribe? A diatribe. A diatribe. Yeah. That, that's an actual, <laughs> and it's a wonder that whitefellas haven't taken this up. Um, I, I think Italians probably would have, you know, different <laughs> certain different cultures would. But you can get up, say, early in the morning, early in the morning and um, um, uh, give a great speech to everybody. Uh, it's for everybody, but it might be aimed at somebody, but may not. And they're not obliged to return the favour, you know, or anything. But you can, it's the equivalent of standing on the front door at the gate and hold off and, you know, tell everybody what they, what you actually think of them all you know, or something like that, but not truly insulting. And then, uh, and nobody, everybody keeps just going around their day-to-day -day life, their breakfast, if it is. The only people, the attention it attracts might be a few little kids and a dog, and you know what I mean? They're looking at this person carrying on. But it's wonderfully, um, it's sound psychology, really, when you think of it, eh? It's really. venting, isn't it? It's just venting. It's venting, that's right. You're allowed to. No one gets You're allowed to. You're allowed to. Nobody gets, no nobody says, look, venting. you're disturbing the peace, you know, you can't, yeah. you know, keep quiet and shut it's up. It's not about shutting things down. It's about yes. Letting that's letting right. things yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and you have the drama. It's wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. a little bit of drama is always good, you know. I think it's healthy. <laughs> that's delightful. Um, just quickly, we've got a probably two more minutes um, and it's just been a wonderful session and a lot of people are saying thank you as they quickly jump off to go back to work. Mm. Um, but with the logic, the the different logic, did did you have any other comments you wanted to make or oh. people to anything? Not really, except to say that I found Chinese logic very interesting. Uh, the only way I could understand it is that yin and yang symbol, you know, and the thing with that is it's got a curved line between black and white. It's curved. The Western one is sharp. It's severed, either or, real sharp. But um, if it's if it's um, um, flexible, that means they accept um, they accept um, what do you call it? Um, geez, paradoxes, um, contradictions, ambiguity, ambivalence, all the uncertain things. They, they know, practically every other culture in the world knows that you have to accept uncertain things into a logic, into thinking through things. The West, 
The West are the only ones who want absolute certainty. Mm. They must have certainty. It's got to be like this. This is the truth. The truth is out there somewhere, you know. It's, it's not, you know. There's thousands of them. So take your pick, you know. And uh, that's closer to Aboriginal logic, the Chinese logic. Mm. Well, the thing is that someone said in the chat that sounds very Indian in relation to conflict resolution. And the reality is it's 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 the it's Western colonial modernity mm. that is weird that is mm. strange that's the aberration modernity is the aberration that's the aberration the yeah mm. i posted a link in the chat to a very interesting article about indigenous mathematics if people want to read more about that fantastic i'll actually i'll put that link and the link to yin's article um that we recommend everyone read and the link to mary's work uh in a follow-up email to everybody when we share the recording with you so so look we'll start to wrap up i can't thank you enough yin and mary for joining thank me. thank you yin that was fantastic yeah in this wonderful discussion that our community should be having so much more of mm. um, and i urge everyone to look up yin and mary's work and to connect with them. We'll also promote Yin's workshop in November. Um, mm. Sounds terrific. Um, just finally, I think it's a it's a call on all of us to really try to dig down into the depths of why, even in Australia today, we're doing some of the things we're doing at a simple place. If it's not supporting life and love, then why are we doing it? Mm. Um, and I think I personally think decolonizing is the job of everyone. Um, in the non-Indigenous uh, communities um, and where possible work in solidarity with our Indigenous mates because none mm. of us can do this alone and the future of Australia is not set and it doesn't have to be the way it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But other okay. than that, I'll let Mary say goodbye. Thank you. Would you yeah, like to say thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm just saying thank you very much and thank you, Ian. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. Michelle. And Yin, See you if we can hear you, would you and the wind like to say goodbye? Thank you to Mary and thank you to Michelle and thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. To the wind. All right. And thank yes. you for the wind. <laughs> thank you for the wind. <laughs>